Hi there, it's John Sprague, sometimes known as John the Nice Guy, and I am here again for another one of my mentoring style screencasts. Uh, today I'm going to go for a little bit of a walk around um, Ansible Tower. Uh, sometimes, well, I'm using the upstream project of Ansible Tower called um, uh, called AWX. Uh, AWX is a um, open source project released by Red Hat and it is, as I said, it's the upstream open source project version of Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower and AWX, as a result, are um, effectively just um, an automation and orchestration engine for, sorry, an automation and job scheduling engine for Ansible. Ansible, if you've not already looked into that before, uh, is a tool that will let you run a series of tasks and actions um, on an uh, a, set, a machine or a set of machines uh, based around what they call modules um, and it uses a file format called YAML. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna very quickly show you around uh, an environment I've got set up for a demo and then I'm gonna recreate that environment. So the first bit is for people that are just coming into Ansible Tower or AWX uh, and looking to see kind of what the environment looks like, how it works, um, things like that. And then the second half is gonna be how I've set my environment up so that anyone that wants to tr give uh, AWX a shot they can uh, have a look through what I've done. So let me transition. So this is the dashboard for AWX. Um, as I said, AWX is the upstream for uh, Ansible Tower. So if you don't want to buy Ansible Tower, uh, which effectively gives you things like support uh, and it gives you um, the ability to effectively call on uh, Red Hat, Red Hat, the people that, that make Ansible, by the way, uh, gives you the opportunity to call on Red Hat if you have a problem with Ansible Tower. Um, with, with AWX, you're more or less on your own. Um, now, that said, most of the time, not a big problem, uh, but there's, that's the difference. Um, from a branding perspective, um, the only thing that really I've seen the difference is that up here in the top corner is uh, an AWX logo with a pair of wings, uh, and Ansible Tower's got its own logo, which uh, I haven't seen recently, because I've not logged into Ansible Tower for a while. Um, uh, beyond that, the installation is slightly different between Ansible Tower and AWX. Again, it's not a big big issue, but it's just something to be aware of. So what I'm going to do is I am going to walk you through um, sort of the typical way that um, you would work with Ansible Tower. Uh, I'm going to use the terms Ansible Tower and AWX interchangeably, just because I kind of use them both meaning the same thing, even though there's a commercial difference and there's uh, an installation difference. But for most intents and purposes, AWX, Ansible Tower, same thing. So um, most of you will, should be at least vaguely familiar with what a simple Ansible playbook looks like. Uh, if you don't, um, this is basically just saying on all the hosts that I'm gonna, that are in my, inventory, and we'll talk about inventories a bit more in a second, uh, I want you to run a task, and that task is a debug task, and when you run that task, I want you to add a name to it, which is this, uh, and this is the things that I'm gonna pass to that debug. So this is, as I said, an exceptionally simple playbook. It's not gonna do very much at all. Uh, and what I also have in this repository is um, uh, an inventory file, uh, which we're going to use in a bit. I'm not going to explain too much about that now because it makes more sense when you look at Ansible Tower. This is GitLab. Uh, I've previously done a screencast. In fact, the screencast before this one, screencast 003, uh, was actually about Git, Git, GitLab uh, standing up, uh, sorry, uh, creating projects and groups and stuff like that. Um, so this is a, um, a project, a repository, uh, in using GitHub terms, um, inside the group AWX demo, uh, or organization, if you're used to the, uh, again, GitHub web uh, naming things. So this here is the path to the repository in GitHub. It's gonna be relevant in a little bit, but not too much for right now. But anyway, it's just so that you're aware that that's there. So, Ansible AWX. So, as I said, this is the dashboard. Um, and working backwards, um, the bit that you're most likely to be interested in is the jobs. So a job is when you have run your playbook against a host. Uh, I was running some tests against my environment before, and here's all the jobs that I was running. Uh, where you've got a green spot, that means it's worked. When you've got a red spot, that means there was a problem with it. Um, and there's 
three main things that you'll see here. Uh, a playbook run, like this. Uh, an SCM, or source code management, um, update, and an inventory sync. Those are the three main things that you'll see in jobs. There are a couple of other tasks. In fact, somewhere near the bottom down here, I think there's a management job like that. So there's management jobs as well, but the, the main ones that you'll tend to see on a regular basis are, is playbook run, SCM update, and inventory sync. So uh, when you run a, an Ansible job, uh, the main thing that you're going to want to know is, was the run successful, yes or no? Uh, and in fact, when you go into it, it tells you, as you would normally with most uh, Ansible runs, uh, you get the recap at the end, which says, you know, this works, that didn't work, these things changed or failed or whatever. Um, the other thing that you might want to know is how long it took to run it. That's the details there. Uh, and you might want to know uh, although you're not probably going to be that interested if you've got a well-organized and managed AWX environment, um, what the project was, this is the repository that it's been drawn from, uh, what the environment was, you were the inventory that you were targeting it against, and um, the repository um, version that you checked out, uh, what was what was that in that in that um, repository directory? So that's the main parts to it here. Um, the logs themselves, uh, so I'm just just expanded this out so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, uh, it's paged. So um, these four buttons up here, uh, go to a previous page, go to the next page, go to the top, go to the bottom. Um, so we are going to ask it to show all of the tasks that we can. Uh, so um, when we've run a task, we've got four hosts in our inventory file, CUST1 FGT, CUST2 FGT, AWX, and GitLab. Um, there's something special about these two. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but so the task that ran uh, was literally just a debug uh, what, what, in, what information came out of the inventory file. Uh, so down here we've got a series of bits and bobs. So here is the response for CUST2 FGT, um, and it goes on and on and on and on and on, and then you get these three dots. So it's basically showing you a page of data. When you click on that line, it shows you the full version of that, the result from that run. Uh, and for those of you that are kind of familiar with um, how Ansible looks like when you run in the various modes of uh, various levels of verboseness. Um, this is uh, usually just the standard output, but if you get um, if you um, if you have an error with a task, it will show you all of the details about that that response. Um, because we've not really so, if I click on this one here. This gather facts is actually showing you all of the things that came back from that gather facts, for example. But so all I wanted to do was just uh, run these things here. So um, long logs, as I said, from one uh, task get truncated. So you see that the first block ran from line 19 to line 1755, which is the line above that there. Um, and as I said, by clicking on that, you get to see the whole log. Uh, so then the next one was 1756 to 3815, 3816 for AWX through to 6502, and then, sorry, 6501, and then 6502 to uh, 8248 is this one. Um, so this is just three ta uh, one task, really. Uh, gather facts is something that's run implicitly every time you run, unless you tell it not to. Um, and then this is data, as I said. So how did we get to the point where we were running this playbook here? So that comes from a thing called a job template. Uh, and this job template uh, is called execute playbook. So if I just quickly pop back to jobs, you can see that that is the name there that's shown there. So that's execute playbook is a job template that was run. So when I click on execute playbook, this shows me that the name of the playbook is called, is it, the name of the job is called Execute Playbook. Uh, and in 
interesting. Don't know why I did that there. Uh, it's a run job. Uh, you can have a description, so it'll tell you, you know, this is a thing for so and so to run and do whatever. Um, uh, it's targeting the full environment inventory, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and it's looking at the project AWX demo, my demo, and it's run, going to run the playbook called playbook.yaml. And when you drop that down, if you've got more YAML files in there that are playbooks, it will list them out there. We're using the estate credential. Uh, we're not limiting it. Uh, we've told it um, uh, you can just it will use as many forks as it can. Verboseness is normal. Uh, you can go all the way up to uh, WinRM or connection debugging by selecting the various values there. Uh, job tags, skip tags. So this is um, like the run tags uh, in normal Ansible playbook. Skip tags is like the minus minus skip minus tags flag in Ansible playbook. Um, you can assign labels to this job template so you can then filter by the templates. Instance groups means you can, um, so Ansible Tower and AWX, you can run multiple nodes to run your um, actions from. Uh, and that's what this is talking about. You know, do you want to pin it to a specific set of nodes uh, to run that this playbook against? Particularly useful if you've got some nodes that live in certain parts of your estate. So for example, if you've got um, nodes that live near uh, a particular that live in a particular data center or a particular cloud provider and it's a resource intensive job you don't want it going across across the network to and from your thing perhaps if you're uh, transferring large files or things like that that's when specifying these instance groups might be useful um, and so on and so forth um, you can turn on a few flags down here about um, Web hooks and things like that. I've not gone into these at all recently, uh, but so this is this is this page here, uh, and so when you hit save on that, uh, you the launch button comes up because I've made a change to that. That's why that is. Um, if you don't want to make any changes to it, you click on cancel, uh, and you can execute that job. So that would then run the job, like I showed you before. So now let's work back a little bit more from there. So I now want to look at the project. So let's look at the project. So this is a project, AWX demo, my demo. So I've called it that because I am pulling from AWX demo, my demo, ha ha. Uh, and you can call this whatever you want. You can have spaces and any characters you want, uh, but having it relatively representative of what your environment looks like, is quite a good idea. Um, and this is a Git repository. Uh, we can use any of the usual Git um, repository URLs here. Uh, and you can also change to mercurial and subversion. Uh, you can also have manual and then copy your playbooks onto the server, but that gets really messy really quickly. And it doesn't, it means that you will struggle sometimes with some of the other um, features that you have here. A um, couple of key things that are useful to me is that you can specify a particular branch by default. Uh, so say for example, you have a, um, uh, production development and feature, uh, sorry, production development and test branch structure where things go into test first and then they run against the test environment. And then once they've been run against test environment uh, to confirm that all your bugs are worked out of it, whatever, it then goes to Q&A, which is the dev branch. And then when uh, Q&A approve it, it then goes to uh, like a production branch uh, so you might have three separate projects targeting those three separate branches. Um, that's all to do with your change control, your change management system. I'm not going to get involved in that because everybody, every single project that I've looked at has a different way of managing their um, branch management uh, system. Uh, but what you can do is there's a checkbox here that says allow branch override. So if I was to tick that and then go back into my job template, it would allow me to, to pick which branch or tag or commit we were looking at. If you want to be more specific about which part of the um, uh, Git branch, uh, Git um, tree that you're working with, uh, you can actually just give uh, a individual um, hash for a, uh, a, a commit to your um, repository. Again, I've not really worked with this side of things. There must be a reason and somebody's obviously asked for that, but I don't know why that is. And lastly, we have a credential. So if this uh, repository here requires a credential to get into it, 
uh, which this one does, then uh, you provide a credential. And I'll come back to credentials in a second. Um, a very important checkbox for me here is this update revision on launch. Uh, and also, depending on your environment, these are also very useful. So um, for example, when you click on launch on a job template to run a job, um, if this box checkbox here, update revision on launch is checked, then what happens is it actually uh, runs effectively a git update, uh, sorry, a git pull rather, git, git update, that's not even a command, git pull uh, on that branch. Uh, on that on that repository um, and it, that works in relation to this uh, SCM branch thing here so it'll do a git checkout git branch so git checkout git update so on and so forth um, if your playbook that you're working with in your in the repository uh, makes changes in the file structure that you're working with this clean and delete on update these two uh, flags are really useful um, because uh, clean just basically says uh, remove everything that that um, might have been created as part of this run whereas delete on update means delete the directory check it back out again so this one says just reset it back to normal this clean one this one says delete the directory start again from scratch uh, two very different uh, ways of working with git but it's just something to be aware of. There's also a cache timeout. Uh, so for example, uh, I use this more with the inventories, which we're coming to in a few minutes. Uh, but this basically means when it, if you've got this update revision on la launch, uh, but you've already updated it in the last X number of seconds, uh, and your cache timeout is say for example, 10 seconds. So two people come along, they both hit uh, launch to do with a job at the same time, um, rather than it doing a git checkout for both of them, what it'll actually do is it'll do this cache timeout. So it'll it'll check the cache first and make sure that it's not running to get pulls at the same time. Quite a useful thing. Uh, so credentials, let's step back into that for a second. Uh, here I have four credentials uh, and you can have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of credentials with Ansible Tower. Uh, but so um, the main ones that I'm interested in right at this second is the GitLab one, which we worked with before. Uh, and that is essentially just a um, a username and password or username and SSH key. Um, there's a reason why that's different from machine. Uh, essentially because you might want to allocate different people to be able to change different things. GitLab's, sorry, GitHub, sorry, your source control credential uh, is obviously related to which account has access to that environment. Um, so for example, GitLab uh, has impersonation tokens and things like that, or um, personal access tokens. That would be what you'd be using in there. You wouldn't typically be using username and password. Uh, what I would also say is that this should really be a service account that if that login occurs from anything other than your Ansible Tower environment, then you should raise that as a security incident because that then means your Ansible Tower environment's breached. Um, when I ran the job before, um, it used this machine credential to log into two out of those four machines. There's a reason why it was only two out of those four machines, but I'll come to that again in a second. Uh, so this is a machine credential. So what you might have is, um, in your environment, you might have um, uh, an Active Directory or something like that. You've got a service account that Ansible Tower can use to log into things. You don't want people that are not Ansible Tower uh, administrators from being able to access it. So this is why this owners field that's over here is important because owners, and I'm an admin on this, I'm running this as the admin account, um, but the admin account uh, can obviously get to anything that admin can get into. But um, if I was just using a, a user that was part of this organization, I'll come back to organizations in a second, um, but they would only be able to make changes to the credentials that they've got. Um, these are, um, these two credentials here are tokens for um, use with 
the two respective cloud environments. Uh, but like I said, if you click on add, you'll see all the different options of credential types that you've got. And we've got five pages, we've got 22 different um, credential types. So Amazon Web Services, Ansible Tower, CyberArk, GitHub. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of options here. Um, so. so we've done credentials. Um, we've done projects. Uh, I'm going to very briefly mention organizations. Organizations is probably the biggest sticking point for me with how Ansible Tower works, AWX works. Um, and that's because it isn't really intuitive from a, what does, what the do certain things mean to you? Effectively, an organization is a way of assigning permissions to things and you can create teams inside organizations and have those teams have different permissions and things like that. Um, what I would tend to do is say that, um, an organization should be responsible for one part of the puzzle. Uh, I've not done that here because uh, it was kind of a bit of a bodge to prove something out here. Um, but so this has got an inventory and a template and a project all under this organization and that's not really right. It should be um, inventories are managed by one group of people, um, projects are managed. Anyway, again, it depends on how you slice and dice your environment. Uh, you can create lots and lots and lots of organizations. You can create individual organizations. Uh, you can have users and teams. So let me have a quick look at users. There is one user here. Um, you can use things like, um, uh, I can't even think what the environment's called, uh, LDAP, SAML, things like that to do logging in. Uh, I've not really looked into that because again, this is just me uh, using it to prove how Ansible Tower works. Um, so, I've quickly touched on organizations and users there. There's teams as well. Uh, you can assign different roles to teams and things like that. I've not really looked into how that works. It's a bit messy for me. Um, the last thing I want to look at is inventories. So here is my full environment inventory. Um, and I'm gonna jump straight to this sources tab here. So a source. Um, if you are used to the way that Ansible normally works, uh, you create a text file like this one um, with a series of uh, groups and machines and you pass particular uh, values into those machines and things like that. This source, uh, if you were doing that, you could go into hosts and groups and create your own manual hosts and groups. Uh, but this is Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower is supposed to be working with clouds and uh, large environments. So sources is a way of building, uh, is using your dynamic inventory scripts. So for example, uh, we've got here an Azure environment and an EC2 environment. Uh, and when I click on edit for those, um, you can see that again, it pulls the credentials for your environment. You can tell it to only specific um, pull specific regions and things like that. Uh, again, we've got this update on launch button here. So when we run a job, it will update the source from this. Uh, we also have an EC2 source and we have source from a, from the project. So this is the one that I'm referring to here. So when I click on source from a project, uh, so you see that it's talking about a project and it's talking about an inventory file. Um, something that is interesting about this is that, uh, because I've got these three separate sources here, what ends up is you get the hosts from all three sources. So you see that this is an EC2 source. This is an EC2 source. This is an Azure source, and this is an EC2 source. Um, You've got a series of tags assigned to these machines. Uh, so this is a tag that's been applied to that uh, AWX machine. This is the tag that's assigned to this AWX machine. This is the name that has been assigned to that uh, FGT machine. And then there's a name, no there's not. Um, ah, right. This is an interesting thing about the difference between EC2 and Azure. Azure tags everything um, with just the tags 
and the regions and the security groups. So NSG cost to FGT is the um, network security group that was applied against that. This one here in EC2 is called security group FG, FGT SG. Little bits of a difference, nothing major. This one specifies which resource group it's in, this one doesn't. Uh, but that's because I've picked specific tags around the EC2 one, because the EC2 one is massive if you let it apply all the tags you want. Um, you can't tell Azure, the Azure dynamic resource, to only pick and choose which resources it returns. I should probably raise a bug about that, because I'd, I'd quite like that to be different. Well, that's particularly bad timing. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention, though, is this bit here, is the tags. So EC2, it's really annoying that printing coming out there, but that's my fault because I was supposed to have printed that out earlier. Um, uh, tags in EC2 are prefixed with tag underscore. Uh, tags in Azure are not prefixed with tag underscore. Uh, so this is why I actually had to create this host file because what I needed to do was create my group called all 40 gates and then assign children to that group and then add the children tags to that. Uh, and I wanted to supply some specific credentials and connection strings and things like that to that group, uh, which I couldn't assign them to that without creating the group first. So it all got a bit messy. Uh, so in the end, I just created this these variables to assign to this group and this group um, is then has these children attached to it. When I then ran that, the um, the update of the uh, um, repository group then said, ah, oh, you haven't created these two groups. So I then had to create those two groups. Uh, so as a result, we then end up with these groups here. Uh, in these groups, this is all of the t all of the groups that came back from um, all of those uh, different sources. So uh, we've got the ones that have been imported, like Azure and EC2, Central US, FortiGate, FortiGate True, DB, FortiGate DB, FortiGate DB True, things like that. These are all based on the tags that were assigned to the machine that were built. Security groups, NSGs, all attached to the secure to the machine that was built. Um, and then there's the one that I created. So let's click on one of those groups there. So in that group, we have the specific variables that I've passed into it from this host file. And in fact, also, if this repository also contains a groups, uh, group vars directory or a host vars directory, it will add all of the variables that were in those group vars and host vars to this part here as well. When we click on hosts, we see the hosts that were matched by this group here. If I go back to all groups and then pick uh, FortiGate here, this shows you that there is just one host. So wrapping it all back up again, if we go back into our templates, so you can see here that this has got lots of different pieces that are in here. We've got the inv inventory, that full environment that we built before. Um, we've got the project, which is the Git repository that we were talking about before from GitLab. Uh, the playbook comes from that repository as well. We've got credentials to log into the machines and then the inventory is populated based on credentials and sources. Uh, and then eventually, once you've got all of this lot, you can then run a job to execute your playbook. That is GitLab, oh, sorry. GitLab. That is AWX in a nutshell. What I'm going to do though is I'm actually going to clear this lot down and I'm going to, um, with the exception of editing the credentials, uh, which is just because I don't want to expose what the credentials are that I've been working with, um, I'm going to delete my project. Yep. I'm going to delete my inventory. I'm going to delete my job template. Yep. And then I'm going to build that back up again. So, 
Uh, I will start with an inventory. So I'm going to create a new inventory, inventory, and I'm going to call this full estate. Uh, and this is uh, all machines managed by AWX. Uh, and I'm going to pick an organization that manages that, FN organization. Um, Insights is a Red Hat service, uh, a bit like Landscape, if you know um, uh, the uh, Ubuntu uh, canonical product. Um, and then I'm going to go to save to save this. And I'm going to create a new source. I'm going to say new source. And I'm going to say this is going to be my EC2. And then choose EC2. I'm going to use credentials for my source. AWS is the one that's picked because that's an EC2 resource. Uh, and I'm going to say update on launch. And I'm going to say there's a cache timeout on that of 600 seconds, which is five minutes. Because your environment shouldn't be changing that much every five minutes. But obviously, there may be a window where that, where that all goes wrong. Uh, so next, I am going to go into sources. And I'm going to create a new source here, which is called uh, Azure. And I'm going to choose Microsoft Azure Resource Manager. And again, I'm going to tell it to update on launch and say that there's a cache timeout of 600 seconds. And I'm going to save that. And then lastly, I'm going to create another new resource, uh, another new source there called uh, um, groups from project. And I'm going to say sourced from a project. I'm going to choose my project by clicking on the Ah, I can't. I'll have to come back to that one in a second. So I'm going to go to project. I'm going to create a new project. And I'm going to say this is my uh, AWX demo. And again, this belongs to my FN organization. And I'm going to say it's Git repository. I'm going to copy that URL there. And I'm going to tell it which credentials to use, GitLab. Uh, I'm going to give it a slightly longer cache timer. I'm going to give it 60 seconds. Uh, and I'm going to say that you, it will clean itself up every time it runs. So we're going to hit save. And when you hit save there, that actually tells it to go away and refresh itself, um, which doesn't happen with the inventories, but it does happen with the projects. So we're going to go back into our inventory, going to go back into our full estate, Back to our sources, add a new source, and this source is going to be groups from project. I'm going to go to choose a source, source from project. Uh, the project is AWX demo, and I'm going to choose the host file there. We're going to say update on project update. So it's not on launch because when the project's updating itself anyway, it will refresh this directory. I'm going to click Save. Now, once that's done, I'm going to click, come on, finish sorting yourself out. I'm going to tell it to sync all. So you notice these three things here go from being a launch icon to being a stop button. And these three buttons here all flash. So what are they doing? They are going away and creating all sorts of stuff. Uh, and so this has now applied a series of tags to this. Um, and the one thing that I'm a little anxious about is something that I can't do anything about now anyway. Uh, actually, what I can do is I'm going to very briefly blank this screen. One moment so I can remove a specific group. Uh, which I don't want people to see. Excellent, that's gone away now, fantastic. So I can now transition back to that group there. Right, um, so we have all of our groups here. Uh, and I mentioned before that you get a whole load of stuff with this. So you get uh, VPC IDs and you get um, uh, AMIs and uh, sorry AMIs and stuff like that in this. 
uh, you get the SSH keys that you're using to log into things and all those sorts of fun things. Um, most of the time you don't need all these groups. Uh, in fact, I'd say almost all of the time you don't need those groups. Um, with Azure, you don't get an option to stop those things being populated with AWX, uh, with AWS rather, um, EC2, you do. Uh, and the way that you do that is, where's that gone? Um, there's a set of options you can add to your source. Uh, so where you got this source variables here, um, I'm going to just paste in some JSON. Um, so in this, I've now said hostname variable is that, and then don't group by the instance ID, don't group by region, don't group by availability zone, and so on and so forth. Now, slight downside to this is that this is now cached. Uh, so even if I was to refresh, sorry, those groups are now created for eternity. Uh, and the only way you can get rid of them is actually to remove the whole inventory or to go through and manually remove each one of those groups in turn. Um, or at least if there is a way of doing it, I've not seen it. So, but anyway, so we've now got our uh, full estate of hosts. And if I go to save that, and I'm just going to update that uh, source. Uh, for anyone that's interested in what that group of uh, um, JSON was that I pasted in there, um, that's actually come from um, a uh, playbook that I've created. Um, so what I'll do is I will link to that host, uh, that list of variables uh, in another playbook. I'm just gonna transition again very briefly to my black screen so I can just confirm that the, uh, the account that I was looking for isn't there anymore, fantastic. So uh, here we have our hosts. And again, you can now see here that um, we've still got a load of uh, tags and things that um, we don't really need. It's not a huge disaster. Um, but so we've now got in our inventory, we've got our project. Um, I haven't touched credentials as I said, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm gonna create a new template. So this template is a job template. Um, I'm just gonna pop that out so it stops hovering it over, which is a bit annoying. Uh, and so this is an execute playbook. Uh, and it's a run job. Uh, and I'm going to be using which inventory? The full estate select. Uh, project is AWX demo, fantastic. Uh, and I'm not gonna change the SCM branch, but before I mentioned that you can change this branch. So you could at this point put uh, master or you could put uh, dev or uh, TNV, or you could put um, ABC decaf bad for a particular uh, commit reference, or you can do v1.0.0 if you want to use if you're using tags, things like that. I'm going to choose a playbook, which is playbook.yaml. I'm going to say, which credentials do you need? You need the estate credentials. Yes, you do. Uh, forks doesn't change. Limit doesn't change. Verbosity doesn't change. Everything else here is all good. Um, if you had an Ansible vault uh, thing, so for example, if your playbook uh, was going into some specific details about Ansible Vault, then you would click there and you would also add a Vault credential. And that would then go on to the end of there. Um, all the rest of these credentials here, um, they don't get added to this credentials box as far as I'm aware. It's just the machine credential that gets added to that. So I'm now going to save this. Bum, 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 bum. and I'm going to launch it. So what does this do? This takes us straight to our jobs page, but I'm gonna just drop back to the jobs page for a second, because what you'll see is this is our job here, 58. 
but then you get 56 full estate EC2, which was running. You get the SCM update there. Interesting. Ah, and the playbook run. But why is that saying it's successful? Ah, perhaps because things were already, cra already cached. No. Okay, that is very interesting. Some reason, ah, uh, I know why. Um, so one of the things that uh, some people that I'm aware of have had some issues with with AWX at this point um, is that um, in the background behind uh, Ansible Tower or AWX is a database. Uh, and so when the job runs, uh, it has to inject each of the lines from the run into uh, the log file. Um, that log file gets updated. Um, so that log file then gets pushed line by line into the database. So you can query for specific lines because when you click on execute playbook, you might want to look for something like uh, FQDN. And so that will then show you all of the things that have got FQDN in them. So you'll notice that we haven't got the lines before here. Uh, and for example, if you wanted to say, search for uh, FGT, for example, it will only show you the lines that say FGT. We've got an FGT in there, uh, but for some reason, let's tell it, let's change that so it says cust one FGT. So we can just find the things that relate to custom one FGT, but for some reason, it's pulling up those. Okay, that's interesting. Anyway, but so yeah, so you might want to search for specific logs. But so as a result, it's got to inject each of those logs individually into your log file. Uh, for playbooks that are huge, um, or for environments that are committing lots of logs into their uh, database at, at once, uh, this is a problem. Because what happens is, um, this part here will say successful, uh, but your log file part here will still be updating because it's still having the lines injected in. Uh, so it might say successful, but this is still running. Uh, it might not say finished, or it might say finished before this says successful. Um, this is all fine. It's not a problem. Uh, there are ways around that. And if you get hit by that, then speak to me because, or speak to um, the Ansible AWX channel on Freenode, uh, because there are things that you can do to improve that. Um, or you might need to speak to your Red Hat, your Red Hat um, uh, engineer if you have a Red Hat support contract and you're working with Ansible Tower, for example. So yeah, so that is how I have I would build my environment. Uh, and I'm sorry about the printing job happening halfway through. Uh, as I said, that was entirely my fault. I was supposed to have printed stuff before. Um, so my wife, <laughs> my wife did it whilst I was doing this recording. Not a problem. Uh, but yeah, so that is Ansible Tower. Uh, that is uh, a very brief walkthrough of how I use GitLab with uh, Ansible Tower. So I, with that, I am going to say thank you very much for watching my mentoring style screencast. This was Screencast 004, GitLab and Ansible Tower, AWX. I've been John the Nice Guy, and I look forward to speaking to you again sometime soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.